When people look at it, uh, it looks crazy. That's a very natural thing. Sometimes when we look at it, it looks crazy. It is the result of reasoned engineering thought, but it still looks crazy. From the top of the atmosphere, down to the surface, it takes us seven minutes. It takes 14 minutes or so for the signal from the spacecraft to make it to Earth. That's how far Mars is away from us. So when we first get word that we've touched the top of the atmosphere, the vehicle has been alive or dead on the surface for at least seven minutes. Entry, descent, and landing, also known as EDL, is referred to as the seven minutes of terror because we've got literally seven minutes to get from the top of the atmosphere to the surface of Mars, going from 13,000 miles an hour to zero in perfect sequence, perfect choreography, perfect timing, and the computer has to do it all by itself with no help from the ground. It, if any one thing doesn't work just right, it's game over. We slam into the atmosphere and develop so much aerodynamic drag. Our heat shield, it heats up and it glows like the surface of the sun. 1600 degrees. During entry, the vehicle is not only slowing down violently through the atmosphere, but also we are guiding it like an airplane to be able to land in a very narrow constraint space. This is one of the biggest challenges that we're facing and one that we had never attempted on Mars. Mars is actually really hard to slow down because it has just enough atmosphere that you have to deal with it. Otherwise, it will destroy your spacecraft. On the other hand, it doesn't have enough atmosphere to finish the job. We're still going about 1,000 miles an hour. So at that point, we use a parachute. The parachute is the largest and strongest supersonic parachute that we've ever built to date. It has to be able to withstand 65,000 pounds of force, even though the parachute itself only weighs about 100 pounds. When it opens up that fast, it's a neck snapping 9 Gs. At that point, we have to get that heat shield off. It's like a big lens cap blocking our view of the ground to the radar. The radar has to take just the right altitude and velocity measurements at just the right time, or the rest of the landing sequence won't work. This big, huge parachute that we've got, it'll only slow us down to about 200 miles an hour. And that's not slow enough to land. So we have no choice, but we've got to cut it off and then come down in rockets. Once we turn those rocket motors on, if we don't do something, we're just gonna smack right back into the parachute. So the first thing we do is make this really radical divert maneuver. We fly off to the side. Diverting away from the parachute, killing our horizontal velocity and our vertical velocity, getting the rover moving straight up and down so it can look at the surface with its radar and see where we're going to land. And we head straight down to the bottom of a crater, right beside a six kilometer high mountain. We can't get those rocket engines too close to the ground because if we were to descend propulsively with our engines all the way to the ground, we would essentially create this massive dust cloud. That dust cloud could then go and land on the rover. It could damage mechanisms and it could damage instruments. So the way we solve that problem is by using the sky cram maneuver. 20 meters above the surface, we have to lower the rover below us on a tether that's 21 feet long and then gently deposit it on its wheels on the surface. As the rover touches down and is now on the ground, the descent stage is in a collision course with the rover. We must cut the bridle immediately and fly the descent stage to a safe distance from the rover.
T minus 15 seconds, standing by for terminal count. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Main engine ignition and liftoff of the Atlas V rocket with LRO Elcross, America's first step of a lasting return to the moon. And we have the pitcher program in. April five drinks look good. RD one eighty is operating well. Pump speeds are stable. Air compressions look good. Plus the battery voltages are stable. Tank pressures look good. RD one eighty is continuing operating well. Hawk 1. Vehicles accelerating smoothly at 1.7 G's as we pass through maximum dynamic pressure. And the booster is throttled down right on schedule. Engine response looks typical. Pump speeds are stable. Injector pressures look good. Current altitude is 11.3 nautical miles. Downrange position is 9.9 .9 miles. Velocity is 2,400 miles per hour. And we've begun flying the Alpha by stern phase of flight. Vehicle body rates continue to look good. Battery voltages are stable. Tank pressures are good. Booster has enabled closed loop steering. Vehicle body rates continue to look good. Booster engine operation continues to look very good as we uh, move towards our next phase of flight. We fired the RCS pyro valve, and that system has pressurized uh, according to its normal ramp rate. Parachute deploy. Parachute. <laughs> Thrusters have been re-enabled. Uh, we will control our attitude on shoot. We are decelerating. Wrist mode under our parachute. Our tachometer is accelerated and, and descending. We are at 150 per meters per second. Dynamics phase. Come back again with uh, wrist mode dynamics. Risk mode is nominal. We are nine kilometers and descending. Eight the active. Valid range. Net filter converged Valid with range. a velocity correction of 0. 0.7 meters a second. We've acquired the ground with the radar. Now to of eight kilometers. Sea chill temp has separated. We've found the ground. Expand tones due to earth occultation as expected. We're standing by to prime the Emily engines in preparation for powered flight. We're down to 90 meters per second at an altitude of 6.5 kilometers and descending. Flight EDL, we got some Tweeta warnings. It is in battle short mode, so it should power through them. Director Earth Communications at this time. We may have lost it already. We're down to 86 meters per second at an altitude of 4 kilometers and descending. We have lost act we've lost tones from Earth at this time. This is expected. Uh, we are continuing on Odyssey telemetry. 
Ground solution equals minus 10.8 meters, vertical velocity of minus 82.8 meters per second. Start enabled. Standing by for batch separation. Signal to Odyssey is still strong. We are in powered flight. Yes. We're at altitude of one kilometer descending, about 70 meters per second. Signal to Odyssey Control remains air down to 50 meters per second. 500 meters in altitude. Standing by for sky crane. Constant velocity accordion nominal, altitude error 5.9 meters. We found a nice flat place. We're coming in ready for sky crane. Down to 10 meters per second, 40 meters altitude. Sky crane has started. Descending at about 0.75 meters per second as expected. Expecting bridal cut shortly. Tingle to us, you remain strong. Tango Delta nominal. Oh. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Ideal calm configuration. Rim you stable. Rim you stable. Rim you stable. UHF, stable. Oh, UHF right. is good. Yes. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe yeah. on Mars. Yeah. Signal to Odyssey remains strong. Play EDL. Images are starting to come down. We're beginning to get images. Right, we got images from coming down, folks. If you're calm, configure some Stand by for images. We have seen thumbnails coming down. Odyssey data is still strong. Odyssey data is very strong. Odyssey is nice and high in the sky. At this time, we're standing by for linking. images. Thumbnails are complete. We got thumbnails. Thumbnails is complete. Keep watching, guys. Keep watching the screen. There's more stuff. Any minute now. No. 256. Okay. Okay. So here we are. 
we're going to start. Go ahead. Okay. So we have landed, we landed out at the time we thought we would, and we now have our first image. We have our first image. Um, this we've got is a 64 by 64 thumbnail. The front, a rear has cam image. You can see the shadow there. Um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly which our orientation is of the vehicle, but uh, we're looking through it. In a few, I think in a, just a few minutes we might get even a, a, two, a, a larger 250, 256 uh, frame uh, 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 pixel image um, of that same same end. So we're looking at the shadow. See the horizon is actually in the distance. You can't really tell that. So we're looking actually at the shadow of the late afternoon sun. Uh, and uh, uh, so these are the rear has cams. These are the rear has cams, and, and it so does have a dust cover on it. It does point. have a dust cover, but it's the dust. The cover is a problem. It's the fact there's dust in the air because we've just blown dust all over the place with our descent engines. Fantastic. So there could be more. There could be more. If we get, if we wait, we might get, oh yes! Ah! This is the high res, this is the 256 by 256 image. This is a higher resolution. You see dust particles on the window. Uh, you can see the horizon there in the background. And there is, there is the wheel of the rover safely on the surface of Mars. I can't believe it, this is unbelievable. We, should, we might get another one of these, and if we're lucky, before Odyssey goes away, we'll get two more of these same injuries going the other side of the vehicle, and also probably dusty. This is amazing. So that yeah. is one of Curiosity's rover wheels, wheels exactly. on the surface of Mars. Yes. Oh wow! We, now we have another. It's another image coming down. This is a view looking the other direction. There's still it's still being processed. You'll see it in just a second here. This is another. This is a another thumbnail image. Is that a shadow? That's the shadow of the of rover. Curiosity rover on the surface of Mars. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The, the Odyssey transmission is about to end. Uh, it's about to set below the peak of Mount Sharp very shortly. Uh, so this is about all the data we're going to get, but things look great. It's been a fantastic 300 sols. Actually, the discoveries began even before landing. On the way to Mars, Curiosity's Radiation Assessment Detector, or RAD, measured the high-energy radiation from within the capsule that enclosed the rover. These measurements will help NASA protect astronauts when they fly within spacecraft and are exposed to deep space radiation. Turns out that it's equivalent to getting a full body CT scan every five or six days. By using Curiosity's data, NASA will learn how much shielding is needed to reduce the risk to astronauts. After touching down on Mars, Curiosity drove away from Bradbury Landing toward a region called Glenelg, where three types of terrain come together. We were hoping that one of these terrains, consisting of light toned and fractured bedrock, might teach us something about an ancient dry riverbed that we spotted from orbit. This river appeared to have started high on the rim of Gale Crater and flowed toward the site where Curiosity landed, spreading sediment in a fan across the crater floor. Even before we got to Glenelg, we began to see slabs of a rock called a conglomerate. By studying the size of the pebbles within the conglomerate, and by noting how rounded they had become, the team was able to conclude that they were carried by water ankle deep to hip deep, flowing at about walking speed and extending for at least a few miles. Curiosity actually set her wheels within an ancient stream bed. Getting back to the present, Curiosity just finished drilling her second rock in Yellowknife Bay in order to confirm the remarkable discovery of an ancient habitable environment and to see if there's any variation among the rocks within Yellowknife Bay. We're now headed in the direction of our ultimate destination, Mount Sharp, five miles and several months away. Along the journey, the science team will continue to explore for evidence related to the habitability of ancient Mars.
It's a summer of milestones for Mars exploration. 50 years ago, Mariner 4 became the first spacecraft to take close-up pictures of Mars. 39 years ago, the Viking 1 lander became the first spacecraft to successfully land on the Red Planet. And now, Curiosity celebrates three years on Mars, operating well over a thousand Martian days. Since its arrival in August 2012, Curiosity has driven nearly 11 kilometers from its landing site to the foot of Mount Sharp within Gale Crater. The first year was spent traversing through ancient stream beds and exploring Yellowknife Bay, the site of an ancient lake. That's where Curiosity drilled samples from the lake floor to reveal mineral evidence of long-lived fresh water. It also found carbon-containing organic molecules and nitrogen in a form usable to life. So, if life ever were present on Mars, a site like Yellowknife Bay could sustain it. Then Curiosity put the pedal to the metal to get to Mount Sharp. That's when engineers noticed excessive wear on the rover's wheels. A lot of work went into understanding the cause and how to avoid it. But now we're confident that the wheels can take us where we need to go. It's been quite a road trip. Curiosity drilled at the Kimberley, drove through long valleys, and took pictures of roadside geology before finally reaching the bedrock at the base of Mount Sharp. We spent several months studying these rocks at Pahrump Hills. The science team has been fascinated by all the signs of ancient water at Mount Sharp. It's likely that Gale Crater once hosted many rivers and lakes, carrying sediment to the crater floor that now forms the bottom layer of Mount Sharp. Now that we're climbing through the foothills of the mountain, the driving is challenging. The team relies on images from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter to find safe paths to interesting geologic targets. Getting to the current rover location at Mariah's Pass required a steep climb up a six meter hill. As we climb the hill, Curiosity's ChemCam laser spectrometer noticed unusually high amounts of silica in nearby rocks. What might that mean? Were the environmental conditions friendly or hazardous to life? Could the silica have preserved organic molecules in the rocks for us to study today? We're hoping to find out. 